Hello everyone! Welcome to my latest video. As you can see, I have a beautiful lady sitting beside me, somebody you have seen before. She's my wonderful friend, Andrea. And she's visiting with me right now. Yes. So, yay! So happy to have you here, Andrea. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, great. Now, we did some videos before together. Oh, who's behind us there? Who's that? Oh, it's a little oh, peanut. Little cameo appearance. A sweet little peanut. This is Ryan, everybody. He wants to say hi. Can I say hi? Hi. <laughs> Um, okay, my love. Okay, so what we're going to do today is uh, actually we're going to talk about something that a lot of you had asked about before because mm -hmm. Andrea and I had done two videos before when she was last visiting two years ago and, um, and a lot of people had wondered what was her backstory? What was it that happened in her life because she was brought up as a Jehovah's Witness like mm -hmm. me and what led to her waking up to the fact that this wasn't the true organization as we had been told? Right. So Andrea wants to tell her story and I'm dying to hear it myself because I don't know all the details. No. Believe no, it or not. Really, I was, yeah, we didn't yeah. really talk about everything. And actually I said to Susan, I, I know I need to do this video for people because everyone has asked questions and I also feel it'll help for the people that have heard some stories about me, it'll give some more clarity on my process and on what happened. But it was really hard going over some of this information again. I ended up reconnecting with some people from my very distant past from when I was a child. And I actually had reached out to a couple of people just to clarify some details because some of the things that happened, I was a, I was a kid. So I didn't know if I had some of it straight. But I have the general gist of, of what happened. It was good enough, but it was interesting. It really brought up a lot of emotions and a lot of anger. I got so pissed off again the other day. I actually was, some of the, a lot of the people are dead now. Some are still alive, but I actually felt like looking them up and calling them and blasting them over what happened. Mm. Because, and not just because of what happened to my family, but to other families that were harmed and damaged in this process. And those people people still to this day they have a lot of accountability for what they for what they did because they destroyed families and I it's you can tell I'm getting a little worked up again and I thought it actually dealt with it all so it actually took me aback kind of surprised me because yeah, you're I'm not still like that. really angry. I don't yeah. see because I've way. moved on with so many things in my life and I help people work through their past and their traumas so it was a bit weird for me to get all triggered again which means that I have not processed it because I should have been able to if I was truly had resolved it, I should be able to go back over it and be kind of neutral about it, just state it as what happened. So I'm actually glad for this because now I know I need to do some more personal work, but that's another topic. Well, I always feel that the videos that I do and the videos that Andriana wants to make as well are a healing, not just for the people that we're trying to help, but they're right. also a healing for us as yeah. well because there's a lot of things that we've had to process. and. And, uh, and it's, it's great to get it out there and make people realize that, you know, we're, we're only human. This is, I know the witnesses always say the organization's only human. Well, you know what? Guess what? So are we, right? We have feelings yeah, too. We've we been do. hurt by the organization. They take no responsibility, have no humility whatsoever, do not say they're sorry, just kick us to the curb and walk away. So yes, there are some hurt feelings. And we try to process a lot of things with humor and try to show the funny side of it, but there is also a hurt side to it. And yeah. And uh, anyways, I'd, I'd love to hear some yeah. of the things you have to say. Because like I said, I don't know a lot of the details that uh, that have happened to Andrea. And, and yeah. maybe this is why you haven't healed, is you haven't really got it all out. Yeah, I guess not, but I will now. And this video could go on and on, but I'm gonna try to really keep it to the cliff notes, just give you a general gist of what happened back when I was a child and upwards what led to me making choices and different chain, major changes in my life. So I'll try to keep it simple and brief, not go ram, rambling. Okay, so here's what happened. <laughs> So I, yeah, I'm not going to be giving any names or locations on things, although I'm sure some of the people watching this, you're, you, you know, some people are going to be able to figure things out. Not my problem. I'm going to be as anonymous as possible. But say for why, some why you're not telling the names because it's because there's still, okay. For example, though, some of the people may be dead now, they have children and I view their children as having been victims of abuse of power as well. And some even I have reconnected with. And I don't want to be disrespectful to them as well. Like, I just don't. Yeah, it's not that you're trying I, to hide no, anything. No, no, I'm absolutely not. Because people might no, say you're not I'm giving the names. Book. No, I'm an open book. You know? <laughs> I don't try yeah. to hide things. I just, but, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. How's yeah. that? I mean, that's probably a better way. But it's way a of... kindness. It's a kindness yeah, is why she's yeah. not, not. It is. I'm not um, afraid of anything. 
bring it on. Really not. So that's not it. I just want to protect those who've already been hurt enough. And like I said, I think some of these people's children have been hurt too. They might even not realize it. So that's why. Okay, so back to the story. So growing up first, you have to understand my parents are both very much rule followers. In fact, they are shunning me at this time. I have not contact with them for a few years since a death in the family. Um, very much follow everything they follow and within the organization they absolutely followed every rule um, even with legal matters because that this plays into the story anything to do with the law and being law-abiding citizens that is who they are very strong um, they, I guess people of integrity and good character you know they're, they're just that's who they are and they also um, are very concerned like they're always concerned too about usually about other people they they especially my mom i guess speaking up over injustices and things at least years ago she did that more so that's just kind of the per the people that they are that's how i was raised and that has impacted me in a positive mm -hmm. way to this day so what happened was this my father many when i was a child was an elder my dad is personality. He doesn't like having attention drawn to him. He's very humble about things. Kind of, unless you get him talking, people can think he's kind of quiet, but he's actually very funny. And he'll talk your ear off at some point if you get him going. But overall, didn't like attention, doesn't like any of that. He just wants to do his thing, keep everybody happy. You know, if you're playing a game, he'll let you win because he doesn't want you to be upset that they didn't lose. Not competitive at all, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So he just a you know a good person in that respect always thinking about other people's feelings. So he had a very hard time. My dad's also uh was very insecure too as a as a person um for a lot of different reasons. So when he was an elder what happened? I will just tell the story of what 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 happened because I did not find this part out till years later as an adult. But ultimately what happened was this. On the elder the presiding overseer of the congregation had children one of the children i believe and again i apologize i may not have some of all these details right but i'm doing my best with this the child <laughs> had an alcohol issue i guess and was driving and was involved in a motor vehicle accident alone so nobody else was involved in this but the damage to the vehicle was over a certain dollar amount and the law of that area was that if it was over a certain dollar amount you had to report it to the police so somehow i guess the elders found out people found a few people found out about this and my dad said well you need to go to the police about this well, here's the thing. This elder wielded the sword and had loved his position in the congregation. And he knew that if this all came to light, he may end up having to step down as an elder because his minor child was having problems. You know, just the usual way. If your kid's having trouble, you're supposed to step down or you get deleted or something. That's the way. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to do that and knew that that mm -hmm. was going to be the outcome. Also because it seemed that this particular presiding overseer also had an alcohol issue. So we're talking mm -hmm. a general generational thing if you get back to well, why was the kid having that well kind of is a thing in the family again it was opened up a whole lot of can of worms I heard other things too about something about the kids smoking I don't know if that was true I don't know any of all that that was something I'd heard later on but basically he wanted to look good everything was all about appearances so my father couldn't be party to this and said no you're supposed to go so it ended up there was a refusal to do that my father ended up then stepping down as an elder he just is like i can't this isn't right i can't do this anymore he stepped down and also because what happened was my father needed to be vilified so this other presiding overseer could make sure that he looked good so he had to make my dad look really bad and it was bad of my dad so here really this whole situation had nothing to do with our family at all but then it suddenly became about that now other elders it was somebody else that agreed on the body he also got kind of a, attacked it ended up turning into this huge mess that ended up involving multiple families and then other elders that knew stuff there was one that seemed to compulsively lie and also was considered to be a womanizer I heard later too of him hitting on a friend's mom and her having to turn him away and he was married with a family oh it shut off did it shut off okay so it was just a mess and a lot of the elders like they even though they knew the things my dad had been saying was right 
they were afraid. They were afraid to stand up to this presiding overseer. So to protect themselves and their families, they decided to join in ganging up against my dad with the with this. So in the beginning, my mom never knew anything because my dad followed the rules. Your elders are not supposed to go home and mm -hmm. tell their wives things. That's part of the rules, right? So my That's dad supposed to. Yeah, my dad did my dad didn't. And in fact, how we could prove that is my mom and I love this presiding overseer. He's very charismatic and to this day I was talking to a friend and he remembered him well and he really liked him too. So he, mm -hmm. he was well liked, unless you were on his bad side, like, his, like our, my friend said, he could be vicious, which mm -hmm. we experienced firsthand. So my mom and I had actually asked to be in his book study group. And my dad never said a word, but my dad had kind of stopped going to some of them. He was, I think, just going to a couple meetings a week. He wasn't going to all, he never came to the book study with us. So my mom always knew something was wrong. So I don't know how everything ended up playing out, but my mom ended up, because she's smart and very intuitive that way, and both parents are, she kind of started figuring some things out. But then all these el other, el so the elders' wives, other people, ministerial servants, they all started hearing all these stories about my dad, about our family, to the point where one of my friends, her dad was a ministerial servant, and she told me she couldn't hang out with, hang around me, because her dad said, well, I know things about the Brocks that, that you don't, and he didn't want her hanging out with me like I was a bad influence. Oh my goodness, I was such a, like, a goody two-shoe kid. I was probably like the best kid you could have had your kid yeah. hanging around, you know? Can and I, it can hurt I, can me. I, can I just ask you something? Yeah. Was, your father stepped down. Right? Yes. And was he still pushing the matter about, about the police? No. So no. Why, why My dad's not like that. He did what he could and he backed off. So then I don't understand why it escalated. You think that... I, I don't exactly know all that. I tried to find some of the stuff out, but there's people... Like, I can't talk to my parents again and ask them the story again, yeah. the things I found out. But it ended up, again, because... Other people knew, like there was the other elder that also agreed with my dad. And, and so it ended up, other people were finding out things, not because of my dad or mom blabbing or anything, because actually because of this other elder and the other elders and then their wives all knew things. And it just, and then the mm -hmm. circuit overseer came along, but he was friends with this presiding overseer. So he decided to go after my dad too. And then there was this other ministerial servant who had backed up what my dad and these other brothers were saying because my dad's being at this point being slandered and dragged through the mud for no reason and he'd heard things but then this guy ended up getting in some kind of trouble unrelated to my understanding so but somehow they got him to say some things against my dad and i think this other elder and then but my dad had never heard it directly from this guy because at one point this guy was completely he come to them, he knew things and he was on the, I say on the side, but he was confirming what my dad had said, but then somehow he turned or something, who knows, but you know what they did? They took his testimony that was bad towards my dad and the other, other people and then disfellowshipped him right away. So then they couldn't question him and say, what exactly did you <laughs> say? And they couldn't question him about the things that he'd said to them. And then if that, you try and talk yeah, to him, you can't you'll get he's fellowship. disfellowshipped. Yeah. So they blocked it in wow. like that. So it ended up they him. Yeah, discredited him. So then <clears throat> but it was good enough for them. They took what they needed out of it, then they got rid of him so that he couldn't talk. Then um <clears throat> they were apparently trying to disfellowship my dad. That was part of it. And I and I said to my parents, I go, for for what? And they <clears throat> said apostasy and I started laughing my head off I'm like oh my goodness my parents follow everything like to the rule and the letter whatever they're told whether yeah. it makes sense or not they they follow it all and I, and I actually thought that was kind of funny so what ended up happening mm -hmm. is Bethel got involved because I think my family took it there because what happened was my dad we had switched congregations because we could no, it could no longer be tolerated being in there. After we moved to another hall, they did a local needs talk. They said they were announcing it was going to be local needs. And oh, darn it anyway, before social media and technology, right? <laughs> but I don't know if any of you back in the day remember, people would bring their tape recorders to the meetings because they'd record them from, for some of the elderly and they'd go play the tapes for them. So one of my mom's friends, I think actually two of them, had brought record their devices with them. So they recorded this local needs and it completely slammed my dad. And then my mom got dragged in there saying she was, I don't know, like a Jezebel influence, but just trying not being submissive. And yeah. 
all this stuff that was so obviously about my parents and it was all a bunch of lies and crap. It wasn't true. Mm. And so the people there that knew what was going on, they were upset because they're like, wow, what did you just do to them? So my parents took that recording and they went to Bethel about it and a special committee was set up. Okay. So the special committee gets set up. They come in to do their investigation. So they do all this investigation. They do They conduct all these interviews with all these people, all these elders. And it ended up extending out to other congregations because this was part of the good old boys network, right? So this, this one elder is presiding over here. He wielded a lot of authority, even in other congregations. I think we've all met some like that. So... Mm-hmm. What happened was though, at the very end, like I even had to, cause I had witnessed stuff. I, I remember, I, I still remember on my Holly Hobby stationery. <laughs> remember Holly Hobby? Yeah. I remember me writing out what I had witnessed. So I had my little, it was an affidavit, but my little testimony of what I saw. And I'm a little kid, but I'm trying to help out. I'm like, but I heard them say that, you know? So here's this little kid having to testify. Anyway. How, how old were you about? Like eight? Oh, I think all this started when I was about eight or nine years old, but it, but then it kind of kept going. So I think this would have been more when I was about, I'm going to say like about 11. I'm trying to guess. I was trying to figure that out with someone mm. I, that was an adult back then that were new. We've been going back and forth, but we think mm. it probably ironically would have been somewhere. Yeah. In the seventies, later seventies. So yeah, I was, it would have been like 11, I think. We're going to say safely like 11 years old, but still a kid. Um, So what ended up happening was at the very end of all their investigation, they came to my parents, a special committee, and they said, we know you're telling the truth. We believe you. But we didn't take notes in the beginning when we came to do this investigation. So we can't go. They didn't have their Holly Hobby? They didn't have their Holly Hobby (laughs) notebook. They only had my Holly Hobby notes. They didn't take notes, so they couldn't go back and say, you said that, like, you know, kind of like in a court, right? Like, you can't, that's why the court person there taking all the notes, because then you can say, but you said on this, it's part of the court record. They they didn't have that. So they totally said they believed they knew my parents were not lying. They were telling the truth. So they did block them from disfellowshipping my dad. Again, I rolled my eyes, like, what the heck? That was insane. So they blocked, the only thing they did for my family over my dad was they blocked him being disfellowship for no good reason because that was just stupid the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life so it really now this impacted a lot of families because other families knew of things they knew what was going on there was like again it was a big abuse of power on all levels everything from people having friends in Bethel to circuit overseers to whatever it ended up becoming an all just to save when you dig dig back down to where did it all start all to do with somebody who had a lot of personal problems his kids had problems and he couldn't face it and own up to it or take responsibility and then I feel bad because his kids more stuff happened down the road long after we moved and he ended up being removed or stepped down as an elder for a certain time period and then he got appointed again so more things happened so it mm-hmm. kind of all came to light later with a few of these people that their true character showed. So not everyone's character was exposed down the road, but a lot of them were. So the people say, well, then justice was served. Well, yeah, but what about the other people? There was families that actually broke up over it. Like there was so much family discord. I mean, I walked around as a child on eggshells. I heard my dad sobbing and crying. You, and my dad does not cry. He's not a crier. He's English, you know, stiff upper lip. I mean, he's fun, but... No, he never did that. And I remember hearing him crying and I remember trying to figure out what was going on. I always loved being like a little detective. I love mystery novels. I remember listening at doors and trying to listen through walls. I was doing everything to know why is my family? Why don't I have a childhood? So this was crucial formative years. I feel like my childhood was ripped away and I know all these other families, some of the stuff they went through, that's, they were just collateral damage. Nobody gave a crap about them. And so I learned when I was a kid, you cannot count on Bethel because if people have friends and whatever, and even when they're supposed to send their committees in, good luck to you with that. They're not going to help. So anybody in authority, what the power that these elders should never have over people to wield it over. You're great. If you've got an awesome elder body, 
stick there. If any witnesses you are watching and you've got great elders, I'm really happy for you. Stay in that congregation. Don't ever move. Because if you end up in some like other ones that are out there, you, your life is done you know, with, within the organization. It's just, they make it a, like a living hell for you. They don't believe in hell, they just create it. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead too much, but <clears throat> what, is, what I don't understand is if, if Bethel had done a proper investigation, like they claimed. They would have removed all, all of those elders. But what all. happened? But, nothing, so nothing happened. So they, they, only stopped, they only stopped my dad from being disfellowshipped and told I don't get. Ver verbally or orally, they only said, we believe you and know you're right. We know you're not lying. You did everything right. We know that. So they got told that, but there was no, oh my goodness, you're never gonna get anything in writing. That's the other thing I learned when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any mistakes made through Bethel or through the organization in general, you will never, ever, ever get an apology in writing or an out loud acknowledgement, ever. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. all the sexual abuse stuff now is such an, more of a nightmare and they've they're making it worse for themselves which is great they they need to, they need to be held accountable but that is what happens i mean they turn oh, yeah. this very small issue into yeah. this massive huge bethel that, investigation that ended up affecting a lot of families again my upset and my anger isn't just for me because i'm okay like i'm in a really great spot now but that's a, for another story i have to deal with this <laughs> tell you guys the crap first but I look at these other families, all the damage and that still that they still, some of them still suffer with and, and the things you don't know about, including the families of these elders that were really spineless. Like, oh, snake in the grass was one expression they used for one of the elders, the stuff he did. Like they, they just ganged up and they were like just slimy, like disgusting. Like I have less than zero respect for these people with what they did. You know, and I understand people make mistakes, but you know what? Years down the road, they should have called my parents and apologized mm -hmm. to them. No, no, they won't. They should have. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, these individual people. You know, if you make a mistake with somebody, mm. you need to go fix it right or say something. Like, do in some way to make reparation in some way, mm. which. That's another part of my story. No, they don't. I mean, I if someone is disfellowshipped wrongly, <clears throat> let, let's say, for example, they've changed the rules on something. Yeah. And they said, oh, like like the way they used to disfellowship people, when it, I forget what it was, at Pornia or something, and they, there was a, anyways, so this was, there's been some weird things before where a woman went to the elders about her husband who was having sex with a goat or something. <sighs> and they said that wasn't fornication because it has to be between people. And she ended up leaving him and she got disfellowshipped. Yeah. And then she well, couldn't remarry scripturally because, yeah. hey, he was with a goat, yeah, not, he was not with a woman. Person. So, but so, <laughs> so the society is wrong and they've now come to recognize that they were wrong. But do you think they've ever gone back to people like that and no. said, oh, we were wrong? Never. You know, no, Never. they don't. We stumbled you. They stumbled somebody. Yeah. But it's all, you know, that, that's, yeah. that's the way they operate. They will not apologize, just like Andrea said. Yeah, they will. And okay, so something else I found out in more recent years was I was seeing some comments in an ex JW forum and I recognized the name of this person. He's young, younger than me. And I recognized the name and I saw his comment and he, I remember him as a child because he's younger than me and I'm not, I'm getting, I'm getting very careful. So <laughs> there was a lot of people younger than me that were, were male there. So, um, so I want to be careful of, but he was very sexual. Like he would constantly grabbing at our crotches and trying to grab our hmm. breasts and all kinds of stuff. And he was young, but you see, we didn't really do anything about it. We just kept saying, stop, like, stop. You don't do that because we were older than him. So it wasn't like it was somebody older doing it. Like we never really, nobody ever took care of it. Cause like, I was just a kid, you know? And I now, like time. what I know now, like down the road, I thought back to him, and this is before I saw his post, by the way, I thought back and I thought, you know what? He is exhibiting behavior of someone who's been sexually abused as a, as a small child. He's like playing it out, mm -hmm. not necessarily, but very stereotypical behavior in the textbook for someone who's been sexually abused. So don't, you know, do, 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 do. years later, I see a post and he suddenly, I see this guy saying, yeah, and I was dodging pedophiles when I was a kid or something like that. And I'm like, oh, I was right, unfortunately. Yeah. So that would have yeah. also would have been in the same congregation. So I feel also gut feeling, no proof of it, except for now him saying something that there was other things going on in that congregation that we didn't know about. There was just a bad air, mm -hmm. you know, of, of things. It wasn't it wasn't right. So little side note on 1975, because this story is about my story, but the waking up thing. 
Um, I remember the 1975 thing to some extent, even though I was a little kid then. Um, I remember asking my dad, well, aren't you going to sell everything? Because people were canceling insurance policies. They were selling their homes. They were quitting doing all jobs. these very, quitting their jobs, making very bad financial decisions. And I asked my dad, well, aren't we going to do that? And my dad goes, or I thought I asked him later, why didn't we? Something like that. But I still, I, what I remember is what he said. He said, no, I'm responsible to take care of this family and we don't know the day or the hour and Jehovah created us with a brain, so we need to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so my so my dad did not quit his job or sell everything out from underneath yeah, us. So that was my a good dad thing. did. Oh <laughs> Your dad did yeah, yeah, he quit his job for the government and he and we didn't we ended up selling our house afterwards because he couldn't get his government job back. And then he ended up being a janitor for the rest okay. of his life until he died. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, you're a father of three kids. I guess my dad didn't use his brain. Yeah. <laughs> it's because he had three kids. He was busy. My dad only had me. <laughs> but he wasn't tired out. It's crazy. Yeah, it was. Okay, so another simultaneous thing happening, and <laughs> also in my family, just not us personally. Uh, my, my uncle, who's deceased now, was, he was a circuit overseer, a really good one, actually. And he, when he left the circuit work, he started working for, I'm going to call it company A. He was a very dynamic, he had a very dynamic personality. He could sell anything, you know, but he also had a lot of integrity in the way he did everything too. That's just how my family is in general, which is good. So he, anyway, he worked for this company, did very well, did very well for them. And it was a franchise company. It ended up over time. This is the very short version what that product purported to do versus what it actually did, there was a discrepancy. Not only that, but this company A actually violated its contracts in a way. They, they broke, I don't want to get into too much. They broke the contract. Was it a witness company? It was a witness oh, yeah. Oh, that's not the important part. Duh. Sorry. That's a key part. Thank you. It was a witness company. It was a witness-owned company. Then company B started, which was also witness-owned, I think. I think it was, yeah. And company B had a product, a similar one, that actually did what it said it would do. It had other ingredients in it. It was a different product. So my uncle, because of that situation, he got asked to go work for this other company. And this, this uh, company A had really had broken all the contracts by certain things that it had done in a business sense. So really, he was free to, to go. So he did. Well, company A got mad because, of course, there goes their, you know, people are starting to get this other product and, you know... So they ended up, they sued company B, even though they're brothers and you're not supposed to sue brothers. So company B did a counter suit. That also, they were getting in trouble for, they're like, we're defending ourselves. You know, we have every right to do what we did and we're just defending ourselves. We didn't go out suing them. We're just counter suing as a, to defend. So anyway, it ended up in a big mess. And also because company A, uh, the person owning it, gave a lot of money to the branch and had a lot of friends in high places. So it was a whole other mess that also divided people up. So understand, as a child, I learned you really can't, when push comes to shove, people are not going to take in positions of authority in the organization. Everything's all about appearances. They are not going to take responsibility. Nobody's ever going to apologize. Don't get involved in business with other witnesses because mm. something goes awry, you're screwed. You're screwed. You're screwed because you can't, your, your hands are tied with everything. So all this stuff it. I saw as a kid. Yeah. But again, it's a perfect organization with imperfect people. Very so, imperfect people. <laughs> and what ended up happening for our family is my father got a job opportunity to live across the country in a place he always dreamed of living. So we moved. And my dad said, I want to save our family and our spirituality so we moved across the country what i will say is this <laughs> in the congregation that we moved to that i loved them the elders there they were good guys like they were like they were good people to this day i have very warm feelings about them and they really helped me a lot and oh i don't want to get emotional man this is so weird this is like well, five I'll, million years ago well funny enough she, oh. so andrew i didn't know her but she moved from Ontario, which is a province in Canada, to British Columbia. And my family, I don't know, what year did you move? Did your family move? 81. 81. My family moved in 77. And so after the 75 debacle, my yeah. family ended up selling their home. And we moved also to British Columbia. 
But our haul wasn't so great. <laughs> we moved from like the, 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 <laughs> the average in Canada of hours was about 10 hours a month. Yeah. We moved to a congregation in BC that had 5.6 or 5.7 hours a month with wife, uh, elders that were wife swapping. And there was all kinds of weird, oh. it was really weird. Oh, I mean, yeah, I did hear about that. As a that, kid, I, I remember thinking, what the heck? I mean, cause I, and as a kid, I didn't really know much. Right? I don't wife yeah. swapping. What is yeah. that? That sounds That's fun, a, eh? That sounds like but, two square dancing. <laughs> But it's just interesting. So you moved to a great hall. And I did. Mine, I, I moved I did. from the opposite, from a good hall in Ottawa yeah. to a weird, you know, BC was, kind of, well, I was in Victoria. You were in Nanaimo. Yeah. And I'm right? trying not to say places, but it's okay. okay. Oh. But it, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And yeah, the that's what the good ones were, so we're okay. Should I out the guy's name too? Well, I guess everybody it? knows no, who I am anyway. Me. It doesn't matter. Anyways. Yeah. It doesn't so. matter. It's just the Ontario one I don't want to get into for protecting yeah. the innocent. Um, okay. So back to that. Sorry, if you see me looking down, I made some notes between yesterday and today of things I want to cover because I don't want to do this video again because it's hard enough as it is. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm in this nice congregation and they really tried to help. My mother actually has had a, one or two nervous breakdowns. I think I've lost track or maybe there was more. My dad pretty much had a breakdown too. So I had pretty much between childhood and teenagehood, I had very emotionally unavailable parents you know, I mean, I was all provided for in every way, but not in that way. So that always made me, and I was always very mature for my age. So, but it made it more that I, you know, I was always like a little adult always, you know, and I guess being an only child to year around adults more so that I just feel like I was never a kid. That's why I've been catching up on some child things now, which is kind of fun. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, another things that bother me again, cause you want to know why I left what it because it was a whole process of things happening this wasn't just something overnight i remember with the reasoning book going door to door and some of the things i rem i still remember some of the people that i called on and again i was very zealous and you know wanted to pioneer and i did and you know i did a lot in that regard i was um but the, some of the things like I felt there's so many double standards. You were told to tell people, well, why won't your organization let you read this? What is it they're afraid of? And there was all these things I would say, and I'm thinking, but we're not allowed to either. And then the other one was, um, mm -hmm. the thing about interpretation in the reasoning book, that we don't interpret the Bible, the Bible interprets itself. Well, that is so lame, because if you're reading a scripture and you say, this is what it means, that's called interpreting it. That's just what that is. You can play with semantics and play with words all you want. Bottom line is, if you read something and you then start saying, and it means this, and when you look at the organization, all the prophecies, all the things they talk about, they're interpreting to the yeah. best of their ability what they Massively. think that that means. That's called interpreting. So wake up, you're interpreting. Like, like how, no matter like how, how you look like at how it, Jesus, it stupid. How Jesus supposedly selected them in 1919. Show me in the Bible where it says that. And if you can't find that in the Bible, that Jesus selected the Jehovah's Witness organization in 1919, then you've just interpreted the scriptures. And, and it's funny because I never thought about that. I, I would say it in service, I'd say, well, we know we don't interpret the scriptures. We let this Bible interpret itself. Yeah. Because we use this scripture here and this scripture here and you put them together and it comes up with, the, you know, the proper meaning of it, not just taking something out of context. But... When you think about overlapping generations and blood fractions and all the different policies the witnesses have, that is you interpreting the scriptures. Yeah. And so things like, for example, transplants, that was considered cannibalism. I remember that, that when you weren't supposed mm -hmm. to have a transplant and then that suddenly changed. But people died, literally died because of that teaching. It's like, oh, well, Jehovah will resurrect them. There was this cold again a lack of res self responsibility and organizational responsibility when you tell people certain things and everybody's doing it and there's bad consequences yeah they made a choice to do something but you told them to so what do you think they're going to do they don't want to be unfaithful but there was no re there's no responsibility for anything and something and actually susan didn't re remember this but many of you probably will if you're older like me um that Besides disfellowshipping, they had at one point a version of disassociation. So any unbaptized publisher who got into some trouble and wasn't repentant was disassociated. They were treated exactly the same way as a disfellowship person. And that bothered me back then so much because there was somebody that, uh, that I was friends with that I just adored. And he got in some trouble. He wasn't baptized. He's a gentle soul. It's just... 
I wish I could find him today, but um, he was disassociated. And that really was bad because he needed to be around because one of his best friends, you know, was really good. I mean, very strong in the, in the religion and in the, in the faith. And he's like an elder now, I think, you know, he's still in the organization. So he would have been better off. Like we wouldn't have been badly influenced by him because we weren't those, that kind of people. We would have helped him, but we cut, he got cut off and he ended up getting spiraling. And I feel, Mm. I felt like personally responsible. Like even though I was doing what I was supposed to do, that whole sense of responsibility really started rising up like why am i going along with this this is just it's hurting it's harmful and it's affecting people's lives in a bad way and some people are dying over some of these things that always bothered me i had this other friend who married somebody and never should have married the person terrible match i remember saying to that person before they got married because i knew they weren't really in love they they should never have gotten married i said it's okay if you don't want to go through with this because i think they were crying about it i go you don't have to i understand with engagement they make it sound like it's some big deal you're engaged you must go through with it no you're not married though you're engaged if you don't feel you should do it (laughs) don't do it i go it's okay whatever you choose you know i support you like you need to do what's right here no, because it didn't work and because of the father's position, didn't, didn't want to rock the boat, whatever, married the person. And guess what? It didn't work out. Bad match, bad marriage. And then the only way to get out of it was either the spouse would die, which, you know, they weren't going to commit murder, or they had to commit adultery. They didn't want to do it, but they did it just to get out of the marriage, just so they could end it. And then, of course, the person's disfellowshipped because they were baptized. And the next thing you know, cut off from everyone and I was mad and even my grandfather even made some comment about it like they should he knew they pushed this person into marrying this other person that that, that he could see it was a bad I remember him still being mad about it and 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 then she got left high and dry high and dry and that that always bothered me she's the guilty party yeah but really, who, who really was responsible? Was she responsible for what she did? Absolutely. Again, I'm all about self-responsibility. However, age, how young, maturity level, all that, everybody pushing to it ended up turning out badly. But no one, then everyone dumped her, deserted, you know? And that always bothered me. So I went on this mission of making amends with finding people after, but that's another, that's for another video. Cause this is already, I apologize. You guys this is getting longer, but remember you can always just stop this and, you know, go have some coffee or whatever and just watch the minute mark you're at. Okay. So a lot of those things happening, I felt really weird about, and also even for education, like I really should have gone to call. Like there's a lot of careers that I'm very, still very interested in. And I really should have ex- had a higher, you know, had more education and gone off into those fields. And that always, I mean, I'm doing a good job now with a lot of the stuff I'm doing. I'm created a lot and that's wonderful. But there was a lot of people, like I was very vocal about people not going to college. I still remember one of, I don't know if I, I don't think I told you this. One of our friends, like a lot of us were pioneering, we were younger all together. And and one one of our friends wanted to go to this, take this course that was like a year or two. And we gave her the hardest time. We had her crying and her parents were like, "Uh, no, you're going. Thank goodness. So I felt so bad about that because I was very much like, yeah, no kids and this and that. Like I was very zealous and towed the line and followed the rules. So I feel bad Mm. uh, about that to this day, but But you were just doing what you were taught. Yeah. That was the end was coming, right? I mean, why would you, why would you spend time in school? Yeah. And, and just, yeah, I wasn't even supposed to go to school. No. I mean, Armageddon was going to come before that. So all of, all of those things. Also, too, like, again, just things happening. Uh, my mother, again, some more things even happened after we moved to, this, to another area where she had witnessed um, some domestic, vi- a domestic violence issue. The person had left the abusive spouse and had become involved with somebody else and of course wasn't repentant because she was in a bad marriage and left it but there was a custody issue so she ended up being disfellowshipped because she wasn't sorry about it um and then there was a custody thing and they needed some testimony so my my mother was approached because she had witnessed marks on the neck of the person 
and the person telling her what had just happened. So all it was was she had to do an affidavit up, just very simply reporting what she had seen and what she'd actually observed. Oh boy. And that wasn't in that, it was a different congregation. Um, that did not bode well. A uh, circuit overseer came down on her for Because again, this person's his fellowship, but you know, she wasn't having any contact with the person. That's the other funny thing. She was just very simply doing a legal issue, <laughs> being called to testify. They could have subpoenaed her and forced her there, but what would be the point? She's just simply saying what it was because there was some in injustice there with that. But that's a whole other story. But again, she got slammed and run through the ringer with it. I mean, with can you all imagine that. the whole thing? I, I can't help thinking of Jesus and how, how you're supposed to help people who are, you know, are along the side <sighs> of the row. You know, the, the story about the robbers and the person's lying there on the side yeah. of the row and they're not yeah. of your faith, right? And all the people would cross, the Levites would cross the road and not help them. And it was the Good Samaritan that finally helped him. And it's, just, it's the same kind of story, exactly. You're yeah. helping someone in need. And yes, there might be disfellowship, but all you're doing, she wasn't even contacting her. They weren't going no. out for drinks or anything. Not at all. Did she know? had no contact. In fact, it was a relative, I think, that had said, will you please do this up? And, but, this, but the society has a yeah. problem with helping people because once they discredit you and kick you out, you're supposed to just treat them like a piece of garbage. You're not supposed to talk to anybody. You no. know, if you're just fellowship, you can't talk to your no. to, you know, family. You can't talk to even worldly people. You're not supposed to hang out with other disfellowship people. You're really to be cut off and shamed. And I just want to say that in, in the penal system in Canada, just recently they passed a new law that somebody who's a murderer or whatever crime you commit, the worst crimes you can commit in mm -hmm. Canada, they used to put some people who were very destructive in prison, they'd put them in solitary confinement. And they had a rule that you could go up to 20 days. Well, they said that is inhuma inhumane to do that to somebody. And that We're talking about the worst criminals can no longer be put in solitary confinement. But to Jehovah's Witnesses, who are the most loving people on earth, proper Christians and following the rules of the Bible, you know, the Pharisees, they have no problem cutting someone off and shaming and disciplining others who try and talk to them and try and help them in any way. It doesn't make any sense to me. And, and you know what? It doesn't wake you up. Believe me, if, if, no. it, it doesn't help you. If you're cut off, what woke me up was being cut off by people who I viewed as kind of crappy people to begin with. You're cutting me off. And all the things you've done in your life, and I just did one minor thing and got disfellowship for it, which is pretty ridiculous. And you're cutting me off? I just felt like, no, no, there's something wrong here. This yeah. isn't helping me. Yeah. You know? Thank you for saying that. That's the other thing. I always felt like something was wrong. Like since I was a kid, something just felt off I, and I couldn't odor. and I couldn't even <laughs> put a finger on it at the time I mean now it's so easy <laughs> but back then I, I just knew I always had this feeling of this gloom and doom and a lot of things I never expressed like I never told anybody anything of, of what was really going on in my head like even going to pioneer school I was telling Susan last night it felt flat I was so excited to do it and then as I went in there it was like a complete letdown of things like it just just so many things that should have just made you really excited didn't when there was a reality of it. Like something was just off. And mm. okay, so then I was pioneering, went to Bethel. Again, we did another video about Bethel not being a magical place. I'm not gonna rehash all that. Maybe Susan, you can put the link in the in this. Sure. I mean, it's so easy to find it, but still to make it convenient for you, she'll put a link in. You can go I'll see that, I'm not, I'm not going through that again. <laughs> but basically at Bethel, I learned up close and personal what I already knew as a child. That's basically what happened. And I got to see that there was such a lack of in touch with humanity and reality. There was this cold harshness to things because everyone lived in this plastic little world. And I saw, I see that in other, in other places too, where people don't like how they can, oh, they're just fellowship. Oh, whatever, you know, and they, oh, you died. You didn't have a transplant back in the day. Oh, well, that's all right. You'll get resurrected. It's fine. You know, there's just this like, are you kidding me? And the people because oh, Jehovah will fix it later. Oh, Jehovah will bring it out. Oh, I know about it, whatever. Oh, yeah, but I don't need to say anything. Jehovah will fix it. Completely mm -hmm. like shuffling things off, the responsibility, your self-responsibility. And no uh, feeling. This permeated everything. I just kept seeing that everywhere I turned. And I, so I would say Bethel was like, part of that began my major awakening. And then it was a, a process from there. Hmm. You know, I had a oh, circuit overseer after I left. Oh, I don't even want to bother just talking about that one. That guy was, <laughs> that guy was something else. I don't want to get into it. Can't be bothered. Um, I remember that Dateline episode you were telling me. It was 2002. Mm -hmm. And I remember 
I watched it and I remember my mom did too and I had a relative in Bethel at the time and and my mom had said, well, didn't they apologize to her? And I'm like, mom, they don't do that, but let me ask because I knew this person, my relative knew because she worked in the correspondence department. So I, and plus she just knew things too. But I, so I messaged her and I, or emailed her and I just said, did they apologize to her? I mean, she was treated, this was terrible what happened. It's like, nope, nope, they don't apologize. And you know, there was like, that kind of went silent on that because that's just not what was done. Another thing that, um, again, sorry folks, just looking at my notes here so I keep going. Oh yes, yes, forgot one thing. In the eighties, they announced about reprinting bound volumes. Anybody remember that? They announced about reprinting them. I don't remember. And they said, you didn't remember. Yeah. They said, and I remember this, that I forgot how the letter read, because they read a letter about it. They were reprinting them so you could have all the old copies. Great. But they were going to be making some amendments to them, you know, because there'd been new light and they didn't want any, there to be any confusion. And at the time when that was announced, that little something, little warning bell went off in me. I'm like, why are you changing anything? And I'm like, oh, well, that does make sense about not confusing people because sometimes people do get confused, you know? <laughs> they do. I thought, let's not make things harder for people. I'm like, okay. So I kind of justified it out in my own mind. And I'm like, oh, the organization. Oh, yeah, they can do whatever they want. I literally would let them do mm -hmm. whatever they whatever they did was fine. If they made a mistake, oh, well, it's okay. It'll get fixed. All yeah. the time. Yeah, Always absolutely. bothered me, though. I never forgot that because, again, that seed of, like, this is something off, and now we know why they did all that because, oh, yeah, I love the recent convention with the 1975 thing. Oh, yeah, the whole psychology behind all their videos, I was laughing when I, when I watched the video, and I'm like, oh, the people that were all gung-ho about 1975 were dressed like Rhoda, <laughs> off. You remember a Rhoda, Mary Tyler Moore spinoff, yeah. you know, dressed like Rhoda with the hair and the husband with the loud 70s plaid jacket, like, <laughs> I know, in the back of the Kingdom Hall, like Chris Farley on the SNL, the motivational speaker, that's something I look like with the, I mean, that jacket, but yet the brother that was t relating this to his son, he had on the nice plain gray suit. Whatever, probably looked more dressed like how my dad did. Well, they like to rewrite their own history. They rewrote the history. And, like looking, I, the and I said, remember I said to you, I go, what are they doing? Like, let it alone. Like, don't bring this up again. There's too many of us that were around. And you have your magazines and the stay alive till 75 thing. And they, they can try to rewrite 1914 because none of us are there. Yeah, we weren't there. I don't know how old you yeah. think we are, but we're yeah, not, we're that, not old. that old. <laughs> but 1975, I was there. Okay, I'm going to just say that. Yeah. And, um, and I don't remember much about it. I just remember waking up and thinking the world was supposed to end. Yeah, I was surprised that we were still here. I didn't really know what it meant because I, really, I was really young. But yeah. nevertheless... Um, and it, it's, it's hard to, to believe that they're bringing it up. I know. Why would you bring Bad it up? Bad move, guys, but kind of a great move that you did that. So, so And then try to I'm rewrite it. I'm not totally it. complaining about it. I'm just thinking, I'm not sure who your PR people are, but you should have left that one alone. Because <laughs> people remember me. Because you're my actually mom outright things. lying. They outright lied. But you know what? It doesn't seem to phase them because my mom is a, is a JW still. And it, it doesn't seem to phase her. She, she even says to me things that were said, like that, that thing about we may be off by months, but not years. Okay. So the end yeah. was going to come in 75. And that's why she got yeah. baptized when she yeah. did, because they were expecting this to happen. And then, of course, or at least happen. not that long after. It would be around then. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, as it started getting right towards the, Yeah. Well, then they had to start. Yeah, backtracking, back backpedaling, and then, you know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, she remembers that. So why they would bring it up when all of us are still alive who remembered what happened yeah. is beyond me. Yeah, not, not, a, not a good move, but that's okay. They're pretty brazen. It just shows how brazen they are to re yeah. re rewrite the arrogant, history. Arrogant, arrogant. Yeah. They're arrogant, which is what's happened with all the not sexual humble. abuse cases. Oh, humility is a joke. There's, there's nothing. And, mm. okay, so another thing that, okay, so after I left Bethel and just things that happened, I just started really seeing things. Another big trigger for me, because I'd been pioneering and I'm not shy with things, I had no trouble going door to door. It wasn't a big deal for me because I, I can get people going in conversations, not a problem at all. Um, I started going to the doors and I didn't want people to answer. Not because I was afraid to talk to them, I knew exactly what to say, but because I would start at going to the doors and I'd seeing people that, and it wasn't about, it had nothing to do with material possessions. It had to do with the vibe that I got from these families. They were happy. 
I would see families that they were involved in the community doing great things. They were engaged, like they were having fun and engaged with their kids. And I was thinking, I don't want you to come into this religion. So I don't want to say anything that might convince you that this is the truth so that you'll come join it. <laughs> and when Jesus talked about my uh, yoke is kindly and my load is light, I never ever felt that as a witness. And I kept thinking, why does it not feel like this? There was all these mm. rules and ridiculous. That's why you should watch the Bethel video if you haven't. Just all these ridiculous rules, like making imaginary problems up that we don't need. Life can be hard enough. You don't need extra stuff happening. Mm. So when I could not go door to door anymore because I didn't want people's lives to be ruined because that's what was going through my head and never mind the sexual abuse stuff because you are not safe in a home of a witness with the current policies in place because they've grandfathered in. They might have changed some things, but you've still got the old pedophiles that got grandfathered in that are still, I'm gonna say grandfathered in, you know, that are still lurking <laughs> there. So that's a whole other story. But yeah. the other thing that, so that was a big sign for me there that I was starting to, something was really wrong. It was mm. all starting to bubble up. I could only hide it for so long from myself. <laughs> Then 9-11 happened. The towers went down. And actually, I told Susan the story last night. She, I hadn't told her before that I, my job, I had come to a point in my life where every, my job was ending and I'm like, what am I going to do? And, and I'd been at a circuit assembly. I actually walked out. There was a brother from Bethel giving a talk and he was going on about how evil higher education was and all this. And myself and my ex-husband were looking at each other. We got mad because we're like, we did everything the way you were supposed to. Didn't go to college, didn't do this. And we were, you know, went to Bethel and pioneered and did all that. And then we were, if it wasn't for the kindness of, you know, some individual brothers and helping out and sisters helping out with things, I don't know what would have happened, you know, because we didn't have the resources and the education to be able to be you're in screwed. a place. Yeah, you're screwed, basically. And, but, but, and so yeah. he's going on and on about this. And I uh. got furious. I'm like, I am sitting here barely hanging on by a thread in a lot of ways. And now you're going to talk about it. Why are you so afraid of people being educated? Well, it's kind of obvious why I'm at this point. So anyway, so that had yeah. happened. So then, um, okay. So my job was ending. All this stuff was going on. That kind of was making me kind of reassess life in general. I was really wake, really waking up then, then, then towers went down and a few months before that, when I decided, where am I going to work? And I'm like, oh, I could, I probably could make more money if I went into New York. And I, I actually knew I had worked for that a company. They had one of their offices was in the top floors of one of the towers, like three floors. And I knew if they had an open position that would fit for me, that they would hire me because I had done very well for them in, in, in Toronto. And so I was going to, I thought I could apply, I could go there. And I thought, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be in that building. I, I said, I don't care what they say. Something happens in there, you're dead. <laughs> that was very eerie. But here's another component to it that I realized later. Let's say I'd gotten a job in there. Let's say it wasn't the first tower hit. And I don't know for those of you that may not know, they were telling people in the second tower, they were telling them all of the people, stay put, don't go anywhere, it's fine. Like just stay, stay at your desk, just stay here, stay here. Because I was still am in a healthier way, a rule follower, followed the rules and did what you're told and all that, I, there's a good chance while all your instincts are run, which was the right one, I would have gone, oh, but they told us to sit and it's all the security and they know what they're doing. And, and you know, all the fire departments here are really good because they are in New York, but it was too catastrophic to, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, so well, they planes, lost a lot of people. Yeah, they did. It was awful. Um, yeah, you're sure. But I would have been, I could have been killed just for my rule followerness, you know, being in there. So that freaked me out. And then between that and people we knew with people losing things and, you know, neighbors and all the connections, because a lot of people in the area I was in did commute to New York. But here's what happened. It's kind of funny because some people you think, and with some of them, it made them run back into the religion. Oh, the end is here. The beginning mm -hmm. has started. That's what people were thinking. I didn't get that out of it. How mm -hmm. it, how it woke me up <laughs> was I th felt like, wait a minute, this happening, this terrorist terror attack, or this attack, whatever it is, whatever your belief is on that, that whole thing, 
what happened has happened in other countries, war-torn countries, has been happening for years, years in all these other countries around the world in certain air pockets, certain areas that are known for this. So they've been living with this for years going through this. This was just the first time something on this scale. I mean, yes, we had the Oklahoma City thing, but that was, but this was huge for, mm -hmm. for New, New York. York City. Yeah. You know, and all the and other the things that, too. yeah, and the other things that happened. So I thought this is nothing compared to what other people go through. And it, it actually jarred me awake. It kind of felt like, and I forgot the Matrix movies because I did watch them all. I've kind of forgotten, but I just think of that. I felt like I was living in this bubble world and that suddenly a door slid open and I saw reality. That's kind of how I, hmm. how I felt. Was that it's, the final straw, would you say? In, in yeah, Whitney? in a way. In a way, it was. There was there was some things, and then and then my relative, the one at Bethel, had died suddenly. That was very traumatic, and I mm -hmm. went to the funeral, and then just weird things that happened with that. Again, that's in the other video that I just saw. Mm -hmm. Were like, where, where are your hearts? Where's your compassion? And even everything from like volunteering, like there was no ever any charitable, like real charity work done, which I have done a lot in our area that I'm very, I feel very good about, and. People have been appreciative of, of what I've done, and I've got a lot more things I want to do. Uh, I've stepped back for a little bit. But um, doing real charity work, mm -hmm. like, I cannot tell you how fantastic that is, and it always bothered me. So when I was a, a witness and living in a different part of the States, I, at work, I ended... Can you turn this a little loud? Okay. <laughs> so... I ended up finally signing up to be in charge of some collection because it happened to be a charitable organization that, you know, didn't have any affiliations with another religion or political. Like it was one that was a little more neutral. So I'm like, oh, good, thank goodness, because I felt so stupid that I could never do anything or donate or participate with a lot of stuff. Mm. And even things like recycling. Everyone was like, oh, well, Jehovah will fix the planet. We can just throw stuff away. Like that always bothered yeah. me. I'm thinking, no, we should be being more careful now. But everyone was like, oh, it's okay. Not everybody. But I don't th I think there's been more awareness built now. But again, it was always this, oh, well, it'll all get fixed. Nobody cared. Um, Yet they would slam a big business who didn't show proper regard for yeah. the environment. You know, they'd be very quick to do that. Yeah. 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 And also with how women were viewed, I, I realized too, like when they said, they talked about Bethel being a spiritual paradise and how that was going to be like that in the new system. And I about freaked out. I'm like, oh my goodness, because I grew up in a household where, yeah, my dad was the head of the house and he did have like the final say on things. However, my parents were partners. My dad was very respectful to women and like, he's like, well, you're a woman, which was a lot of what happened in the congregation I'd been grew up in um, my dad wasn't like that at all he just like treated everybody the same and equal as like how it's supposed to be right but yet he there was still according to witness standards that headship thing there but I still saw like a forever perpetuation of men always being in charge and women not being allowed to be yet that's not actually what's in the Bible there was you know certain things they try to brush under that are actually in the Bible so that also bothered me of thinking of living forever like that that really did so um another thing too was my mom very very talented person very creative she had written these children's series of children's books and she's a wonderful art beautiful artist she'd illustrated them um done all that and she happened to mention it to a circuit overseer's wife because my father was going to be retiring and they were a little bit worried about income and my mom was thinking maybe i can i can do this and then i can make some money it'll help contribute to the household fund or whatever because my mom had never worked she'd always I did odd things here and there but mostly because she just wanted to you know be more focused on going out in service and whatnot so I should never any career so she was really good at it and this circuit overseer's wife came down on her like a ton of bricks and basically what? accused her of well accused her of like wanting notoriety and I'm laughing I'm like do you actually like know my parents are not like that at all what Wow. And I'm just like, wow, like crush people's dreams, crush their creativity, and then doing anything that's lovely and fun and joyful. You know, if she'd said, oh, I'm going to go out. If, if she had told the circuit overseer's wife, I'm going to go out and get some cleaning jobs and wash some windows to help support the family, that would have been great. But because mm -hmm. it was something actually joyful and creative, that was suddenly bad. And my mother must have been wanting to be famous.
And all yeah. these people that have put aside fame to serve Jehovah. Oh, yeah. my mom. I was furious, and so was my mom. How old, how old were you at the time? Oh, this I wasn't living at home then. I would have been in my 20s or something. I forget. And yet, if somebody is famous, rich and famous, like someone like Prince or somebody huge like that or Michael Jackson, or if somebody does have an education, like they're a doctor or a lawyer, and then they become a Jehovah's Witness, well, everyone goes goo goo gaga for them, and they look up to, they look up to these ones. So it's pretty ironic that when you want to pursue these things as a witness, no, 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 the end is coming. Don't do that. They push you right back down again. But when you come as one of these people who is famous and rich and educated, then you're looked up to. Like, look, look who we have. He's a Jehovah's Witness. You know? That's true. Yeah. I find that very hypocritical. Yeah. I do too. And so just to kind of wrap this up a little bit too, the the other thing I always started to notice was certain archaeological discoveries again not going to get into all that everyone can do all their own research but there's a lot of things with when the standard thought of when humans start it but other things that they're finding ever even my dad even would mention some things too because he always seemed to be interested in the same stuff like these maps they found that were done before the poles were frozen like how there was no technology to do the map but it matched up perfectly with what's underneath all the ice like there's weird things that how do you explain that if everybody started in one spot and what timing of it mm. there was just a lot of things that just were not jiving for me in general and the more time goes by the more things that are happening and they're finding and discovering and things in science that aren't quite matching up Mm. And that always was like, wow, you know, that really made me start thinking of things like that. There's so much more out there and more to, to, to this life than what they, they keep trying to tell us. It's like this, it's like this, but that just yeah. isn't working anymore. And a lot of logic and common sense would be out the door. Like even things with the light getting brighter, I'm like, okay, so why are Jehovah's people the last to know? Why is he high, Why is he stopping <laughs> you having tools and things to use in your life that are going to help you out now while Satan's roaming about? Is it like he has to give you the hardest scenario, but everybody else gets it easier than you? What kind of God does that? Like there was just mm -hmm. so many things that just did not make sense. They were not, they were not adding up for me. Um, I remember once in the, one of the magazine articles or a question from readers that talked about birthdays. Let's take birthdays. It always bothered me that we couldn't celebrate birthdays. I didn't find it made sense because it, it just seemed like that's a talk about not building self-esteem and, and it's a day parents celebrate. You were born today. It's like the anniversary of your birth. I mean, it's something that's mm -hmm. really beautiful. And I thought it didn't make sense. It's kind of silly. So if you don't like the customs with the cake, then the candle, like, don't have the candles like you could just eliminate certain pieces if it was if it was bothering you so I found a question from readers and saying some apostates use this scripture in Job to say that this proves it was birthdays so I thought okay I'm gonna go look at the scripture yeah. and I looked at the scripture and I'm like yeah no wonder I know it's it talked about scripture. the person celebrating their day so obviously they were being given some kind of an honor and a celebration for that individual for that person they were all, like celebrate like a party yeah. and I'm like that's a birthday party and maybe it wasn't a birthday it could have been anything it could have been just a day of the year they picked but either way a lot of this stuff of not drawing attention to a person well, what do you think anniversary parties are and bridal show I mean like don't be stupid about things it just seems stupid and, and, and I don't know if you know but ha when you say happy birthday to somebody in French the word is bon anniversaire ah happy anniversary of your birthday it's funny oh, isn't it I never thought about that yeah. but it's true yeah. I always did I always thought of that too and yet they celebrate anniversaries of weddings yeah I don't know. I yeah. think. And even things with new light and even like things with blood, like someone had said, once you put all the blood together of what's now allowed by conscience, it ends up pretty much being a whole blood transfusion. And, and that there's a really awesome website out there that gets like right into all of it. Um, you can, can put, put that. Link. Yeah, we'll put I'll the put link in there link. too. You should really take a look at that. And I don't, it's probably like an elder, someone that was in like on the blood committee or something that did somebody, because this person knows a lot or they're a doctor or something. So you really should take a look at it. Oh, and that's the other thing. Whenever I travel and I'm on a plane, I usually, unless I'm exhausted, I usually end up sitting beside really super cool people. So one time I was beside these geologists. <laughs> Something mm -hmm. blanking out. 
because I got so excited when I was beside them, I kind of forgot what they were. But anyway, we talked about carbon dating. Carbon dating! Mm. I brought that up. And a lot of the stuff you're told as witnesses isn't ex how it goes. And they agree that it's not, they don't use it in some scenario. So all the stuff that we were told is a skewed piece of it to make you think, oh, mm. well, then that proves that. Go out there and talk to people in the field so they can clarify it for you. I talked to, I sat beside this doctor. Um, we had some, I had to reach out to her again. She was fun. Um, and I got to talk about blood transfusions and some of the things that we were told, I said, this is what witnesses are told. And she goes, that's not true actually. And so anyway, maybe who knows me one day I can do a video with her. I'm trying to get her to visit. We had fun together. Can I ask you all this time? So when you're going through all and seeing all these different things, and now you're talking about where you were in New York and 901 happened. Oh yeah. Sorry. Did, I didn't. Well, I'm just wondering where were you in your spirituality at that time? So you, so you said that when you called on people's doors, you, you didn't want anyone to answer because you didn't feel comfortable trying to put them into a religion that you knew would make them less happy and, right. and unfulfilled, etc. So what, what about your meeting attendance? Like, like, so, well, oh, okay. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. I kind of jumped ahead. Sorry. There. So, I kind so of you weren't going in service anymore at all? I or? slowly faded all out. I stopped and I had stopped. I stopped going, I stopped going to meeting. Like everything just started cutting back. Like I didn't want to be too dramatic about it. It just kind of all and you were married. just happened. Yeah. And, and yeah. how was he, was he going all the time and he going in service or was he kind yeah, of? For, yeah. Yeah. I mean, some, he was missing, he was missing a bit too. Cause there was stuff I think that, that he saw too, but I got to a point where I suddenly woke up. I, I, the example I've given to people, it's like when you're in a room that's dimly lit and you can see the outline, the haze of things, and then you turn on a light and all of a sudden, and that light for me, like the people light ask, what brighter. was it defining? Light got brighter, <laughs> yeah. Then you suddenly saw everything as it is. And I think people say, well, what was the one pivotal thing? It really wasn't. It was a, it was a series of things that had bothered me since I was a child up until and, and all the stuff that, like, again, I've only shared some of my stories. If I have more stories, there's people I've heard, but let other people tell their own stories. But that's only fair. But I just felt like something was really wrong. And it was like, as soon as I allowed myself to start asking a few questions and sitting with the question, it was like Pandora's box. I don't know what the word to use. It was like suddenly the lid came off everything. The worms all flew out of the can. And then there was, I'm not a fake person. There was no going back. I, you can't pretend you haven't seen something, mm -hmm. you know, like you just can't. I mean, well, some people can. I and Susan cannot no, do that. No. We well, it's, it's like watching the movie, the, the, the Titanic. You know the boat is going to sink. Yeah. There's no version where the boat doesn't <laughs> sink. So when you're watching the movie, you know what's going to happen at the end. You can't yeah. pretend it's not going to happen. And it's just like with the, with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Once you know that there, there's lies and, and half-truths and, and cover-ups and nastiness and non-humbleness and just awful things that have gone on, you can't go, oh, well, they're just some perfect people. Because at the end of the day, then how can you justify condemning other religions? Yeah. How can you say this is God's organization? Jesus selected them in 1919, yet they were celebrating Christmas and birthdays and they had crosses and they didn't have problems with blood transfusions yeah. and blood fractions. And you know, nothing is similar to the way it is now. And yet he chose them. So I guess Jesus has no problem with any of those things because he chose a religion that does all those things, right? So how is it that he chose, how are they better than anybody else? I don't know, but if you watch the Australian Royal Commission, you'll see that they're not better than any other religion. In fact, they're quite a bit worse than most other religions. And that's why we feel the obligation to speak out and just tell people they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are not at all what you think they are. There's a wickedness in this organization that, that has to be exposed. It's, it's, not, it's not, yes, there's good people in it, but there's also this nasty wickedness in it that I just can't, it's funny, like I, I've evolved myself as, I, as I've, as I've come right. along, you know, and, right. and just in talking with you and realizing that I'm not making this up, that you feel the same and, mm -hmm. and everybody else we meet who's left it has felt the same too. And it's not a bitterness or an anger. It's just, we've seen things happen along the way that we couldn't unsee. And when you put it all together, it spells rotten fruitage, the rotten mm -hmm. fruitage that Jesus spoke about. Mm -hmm. And the tree is rotten. I'm sorry, but there's not good. I'm not trying to find the bad, but I cannot mm -hmm. ignore the rotten fruitage that is there. And yeah. that's what makes this tree something that must be chopped down. You know, yeah. like all the other trees that, that Jehovah's Witnesses condemn, <laughs> you know, for the things that they see happening in, in those bad religions. But well, we see it too, but it's in your religion this time. Yeah. So then what happened for me, as I realized everything, I suddenly, it was like dominoes going off in every, in every direction. And I realized 
every single decision, every single decision I had made in my life from childhood onward, all was centered around the organization and the religion, not around God, around the organization and the religion, every single decision and whatever rules they had at the time yeah and whatever would be best it would fit in with this it would fit in with that so you would do this like not going to school who you marry everything would fit mm -hmm. into that so as soon as i realized that i'm like oh my goodness it reminded me of that song like talking heads and the days go by oh, no, 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 no. and that's not my beautiful wife that's not my house you know so <laughs> do you know that song i'll put that we'll put the link to okay. that one in there too i always got a kick out of that song but it was like i realized my whole life wasn't no wonder i felt like something was wrong i wasn't living my life yeah. and so okay so then i asked you asked what happened after that well i realized i had to make radical changes which i did i left my husband at that time and also because I knew it would be pretty much impossible with I could see what I was learning and all the stuff was about to because now I was going to go look and explore things and you know research and do all that I thought I need I just need to go so I did that um, I never didn't share things with my my parents on the journey because here's what I did that is maybe could be the same as some of you are a little different when I left I first refused to meet with the elders because they did attempt. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I even cut off from my job because I remember I mentioned my job was ending. I never kept in touch with anybody from my job. I more recent years have reconnected with them. But I cut everybody off and started fresh. I didn't want any influence from my past. I knew every witness would be cutting me off. And it was easier for me because I exited on my own terms. I faded. I was already living thousands of miles away from like good friends I'd had growing up. So there wasn't that close proximity of me running into them. And I know some of you go through that and I, that's, that's so hard. That's horrible. Like I really feel mm -hmm. for you. So I was at a better advantage in that sense, but I never told my family and I always kept with my parents. I kept saying, because my mom would be probing, like wondering, what do you think? Because she knew I wasn't, she just figured I was inactive. That was what she thought, that she felt like I still believed everything. And I wouldn't, she kept asking me things. And I said, you know what? I said, we have so many things to discuss. I said, I don't want to talk anything about religion or beliefs. You're entitled to yours. Good for you. So am I. Uh, let's, I don't want to talk about any of that. Let's just have a, you know, if we talked on the phone or if I was visiting once a year or whatever, just have a good time. We always have fun together. Let's just have fun. We're good. So it turned out for over a decade, I had <laughs> over a decade. It always sounds longer than saying 10 years, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I had a different belief system then, and I didn't share any of that. I never tried to put it. There was a couple things like the United Nations. My mom had really pushed what's, what's, you know, she really pushed at one point for me to say something. So I thought, let me just tell her about the United Nations because I'd printed stuff off the United Nations website, not ex-witness stuff. Um, and that was the other thing. I stayed away from all things XJW for a few years, actually. A couple of years, two, two or three years. Mm -hmm. I just needed like a break, like just to let me just do my thing and see where things take me. And then I'll just do a little re... Wasn't, I wasn't interested in researching X, like witness stuff. I was interested in like looking at other things. Like what's this in science? What's this in archaeology? Like those things were more appealing to me. Even things of matters of energy and understanding vibrations and frequencies all that stuff had held more appeal to me so i thought let me just learn about that stuff and that actually helped a lot too i did read steve hassan's book combating cult mind control that is one thing i did do because he wasn't a witness and he was an expert mm -hmm. and he it was all about him and the moonies when he was a moony and he i loved in the book where he talked about you think that cults want weak people they actually don't they mm -hmm. want stronger people that can be the leaders and i'm like wow that's interesting so anyway, fantastic book. I recommend that to everybody. Again, he's on an ex-witness, so you can read it. Um, that book helped me a lot. But I was just felt very wounded and fragile. I felt like my whole world had crumbled. All the veils and curtains came down everywhere. The rug was pulled out from underneath me. I was taught things that really weren't right that I didn't believe. It was really a time of really deep grieving for a number of years. And I... At one point, I found a form which isn't really in existence. I think you can look at it now where there was no drama and intrigue and in it. it was just great. It was really helped me a lot. I tried to find a therapist, but nobody specialized in exit counseling, which is what you need. I did talk to a lot of therapists, though, that wanted to get into it and were interested about it. So I had some good conversations. Hopefully I got some that are adding that into their repertoire. But um, that form really helped me a lot. And then the 
and again, getting more involved in the community, that was really good too. So anyway, my parents, um, after a decade, somebody had, had found, someone had found, I was, I, I think I have that all figured out. But anyway, someone had found my website. Again, I wasn't hiding anything. I just wasn't sharing things with my parents because I lived so far away and I didn't want to get into beliefs. And so that spiraled from there of, of them cutting me off to keep that story short. Can we tell the funny story? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so Susan was visiting a relative. She was visiting her mom. My mom. She's visiting her mom. And I knew things could, you know, potentially be a little hazardous or tense with her mother being active. And so she's, you know, with and her I'm family and the, yeah. And she's with, you know, her husband who's never, a, her husband's never a Jehovah's Witness and, and her son neither. So the grandson's there too. So one night, I'm just <laughs> checking in on her. I'm like, we're on Facebook. We have to be on at the same time, you know, messaging with each other. And I'm like, we're both typing away on different time hey, zones. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Are you doing okay there? Just checking in on you. And then she's typing back. Yeah, everything's going fine. And my mom had her assembly today. She just got home and she's just telling me stories. Oh, yeah. And there was this one sister at the end of her row. Well, you tell the story. Okay, so she's typing this to me and I'm reading this. Yeah, because she's telling me this. what's going on at the convention. And of course, Andrew knows it all the same people that I know. Yeah. But our moms yeah. don't know each other. No. That's the funny thing. No. So my mom says that somebody beside her got up onto the, onto the platform and started telling this story about their daughter. And how their daughter had left the witnesses. She she had one time been in Bethel, and she was regular pioneering, and she was really strong spiritually. And then now she is a sh sham shaman. I can never pronounce the word. Priestess. She's, into, she's a priestess. She's with, into Satanism, and she's a <laughs> shaman or something. <laughs> And I'm typing them like, oh, you got to hear this, you know. Yeah, and, then, get this. and then this person goes back to sit down, comes off the platform, and you know, the whole part of the whole audience gasped. They gasped. The gasped. The horror of it all. <laughs> so then I'm typing this, you know, to Andrew. Oh, apparently this happened. And then as I'm typing it, I'm like, I think this is you. <laughs> you should, no, you were like, I wish we should do a screenshot of it because it's like one of the funniest, oh shockingest God. things ever. She's like. Oh my goodness, it's you! <laughs> it hits me. I'm halfway through a sentence. I'm like, ah! It was so oh, funny. And we're both like, just stop. You know, I'm on my end. And now that shows you. Now, Susan knows my whole story and what I do now. Everything now. So the fact that it wasn't recognizable other than a few elements speaks volumes. Yep. And that the person it took was from up long. island. They're yeah, from yeah. Up, so there was a island. few pieces. Yeah, so there was a few pieces she put together yeah. besides the story. That, that, that I'm quite the detective. That. Yes, and we did, and <laughs> I did reach out to someone else, incognito person, who did confirm with someone else that yes, indeed, it was my mother. And not only that, but the story okay. was made for such fodder and was so yeah. dramatic that they asked her to speak at two assemblies. So oh. she spoke at two two assemblies so their own and there so now i'm infamously famous and apparently unbeknownst to myself i'm apparently some kind of a devil worshiper but the one thing that's interesting Stupid. so when you're a jehovah's witness and you hear these stories from the platform i will yeah. say first of all that this was completely taken out of context completely exaggerated oh it, yeah you know made into this like she's like the devil himself you know but it's the thing ridiculous. that's also funny about it is the fact that when you, like, have you ever been spoken about? So, so your mother <laughs> has now gone up onto the platform and basically completely thrown you under the bus. And so when this gets back to somebody like Andrea, and of course, I'm sorry that I'm the one that, that did no, it. No, I'm glad you told me, though. Glad you told me. But when you think about okay, it, well, we were how, does that make you want to come back to the religion? You know, like, does it make you want to, like, oh, these are people that want me back. Yeah. No, they're just that are laugh at you. They're laughing at this story. They're gasping and they're shocked and they're laughing at it. And I find that really pathetic. There's nothing about this that makes you want no. to come back. And just before my parents had cut me off, my mom had said to me, well, you know, the organization has changed so much and it's so loving now. And mm. right after that, <laughs> yeah. she cut me off cold. I had a relative that died. Didn't even, she didn't even tell me. <laughs> like just it, it was just ridiculous all that's of it. love eh? yeah that's love yes yeah, so now thousands of people so anyway so actually susan and i were actually both really upset like i felt like kind of like sucker punch like what and what bothered me too is my mom knows the history of like what our family went through she knew other stories of things that had happened as well so i thought wow mom you get up there you take elements of things 
and put them together in the most horrific manner possible to paint me out and vilify me. And let me tell you also, they would wanted to vilify me to justify how I'm being treated. And mm. also because I was known for being so zealous and because of my personality, they had to come up, like there had to be some way to paint me out as some horrible person. So that's part of actually why I started, because I wasn't going to do any videos with Susan or anything. I was totally off the radar with everything. But I found out, even yesterday I found out, we found out from another friend apparently, um, I'm called a, a huge, like a, yeah, a big, a big apostate. I'm <laughs> she's like, not wow. just an apostate, she's a big apostate. Yeah, I'm a big one. I'm a big one. I'm a big <laughs> apostate. What does so that even mean? I don't even know. I don't well, you know, know what? Congratulations. I should give you the big apostate yes. award. And then one of my friends, <laughs> because again, Susan and I were really upset when that happened with the assembly. Like it both took us off because again, you should have seen, I, again, I should have screenshot it. Your no, thing because you were just stunned. You're like, wait a minute, because she knew what, how it wasn't accurate. And then, um, I called a, fr a friend who's got a really good sense of humor and has been also ha went through a really bad time was just fellowshipped and that was a really sad story the whole thing but but she's doing fantastic now and we're really good friends now somebody i reconnected with and i called her and she she has a best laugh and she burst out laughing she laughed i think for like two minutes straight she thought it was like the funniest thing ever which brought me back to like a, a reality of things and i and i said to suze you know so and so our friend thinks it's hysterically funny you know but um, yeah, it was kind of hurtful. It though. is funny. It's, it's hurtful, but there's it was also hurtful, the, but there's, there's a humor. humor. There's a humor there's side a humor because it was just it. eye roll worthy. Like really, yes. people. You know, then it makes yeah. you wonder. It made me wonder. I thought, you know, all those stories over the year you have people get up on the stage for. How many of them were actually accurate and truthful? We, we, which we've heard a lot behind the scenes. So, but it's, they want to portray in this case, like so, as Andrew is being such a big apostate, <laughs> because it makes them Devil look worshiping poor. Apostate. Them, oh no, look at me. My daughter's now this. I'm so persecuted. You know, yeah. I have to give her up. You know, look at me. Be like me. You know, and to me, that is just. That is sick to throw your own offspring under the bus yeah, so to gain some respect. What is this? Is that, is that what you want? You want people to respect you because you've had to throw your daughter, kick her to the curb? Yeah, I don't. Makes I don't you get a better that. person. Get up on an when you when you're being that? told to do things that go yeah. against human decency and what your gut says, which is essentially what happened, which woke me up. Mm. You, you know, you, you really it's good to question it. Take a look at that. I'm just picturing if you and I were in the audience at the time, wouldn't you love to just get up and go, oh. Like, it's like, liar. may I please, <laughs> may I please tell the, the real story yeah. here, over here? Will the real Crazy. story please stand up? Crazy. I know, I know. You know. It was awful. But, too, bad. But too bad we weren't yeah. there. Yeah, I know. So what I, so basically, again, I keep saying just to wrap this up, but I really am now. I would just tell people what would be my best advice is do your research. And this isn't like finding websites and things that have good information that can point you in the direction. Like I remember one, I don't remember what this was now, but I remember there was like an article that had been written in one of the magazines and I went to the source of it, like the original article that they'd quote it from as, as their source of getting this information. And I read that secular article, which is nothing but really, really I forgot what it was. I don't remember what it was about, but I read it and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Whoever wrote the Watchtower or the Wake article, what did they read? Because the one I'm looking at right here, which was the, the point of it, wasn't remotely saying the same thing. And I'm like, wow. So, you, and you want to be like the Bereans. They actually do not want you to be like the Bereans. That's just a fallacy. It's in word only, name only, that they want you to do that. Well, they want you to research. It's, it's, kind, it's kind of funny. It's like the witnesses have, a, have an interesting program. They want you to research like the Bereans until you become a witness. And then once they've got you, that's the, then you just swallow everything they throw at you. Oh, there was a convention in, in uh, 1919 where there were trumpets blaring. That's what Revelation is referring to. Okay. Like every stupidity <laughs> out there. But they're not going to call yeah. on your door. I mean, they really are wolves in sheep's clothing for the fact that 
They're not going to call on your door and say, this is why we disfellowship people, and this is why we shun them, and this is how we kick our daughters to the curb. And, you know, they're not going to say that. You're not going to find any of that out until years yeah. into the religion. Yeah, I wanted to go you know? tell the neighbors. They just talk <laughs> about the, way, the fictional you know. paradise. You know, the fictional paradise they have with pandas that you're going to be playing with. And, and, and they, they go by a certain, certain things, like the immortality of the soul. They'll make that point. And then the trinity, they'll make that point. And once they've got you sold on a few points and that you're going to be persecuted, now you're looking for your relatives to try to discourage <clears> you. And when they do, aha, I was warned, it's Jehovah warning me that Satan's out to get me now. So then it builds up your faith even more. And then they've got you. And it's only years later you find out about the abuse and that this is not oh, normal. So and this is the shunning and the, you know, that's when yeah. you find out. But it's too late by then because by then you're baptized yeah. and you're stuck, right? You're stuck because if you, if you leave, yeah. then you're going to be shunned. And there's also, there's a lot of people out there that will help you that are nothing to do with ex-witnesses. Those stories of saying, oh, how awful people are in the world. Oh, I could write books upon books of all the incredible, kind, loving, powerful things people have done for me over the years. It has no been, agenda. No agenda. They yeah. just... Oh, you people. need help with this. And they decide, they, they see who you are as a person. They like what you're doing. Like, I want to help you. You know, you get, it's just, in, people out there are amazing. They're not it's counting just, it's their time. It's all who you look for, but don't go out in a victim mode. If you go out in a victim mode, then you're going to attract the predatory type people. But if you go out there with more of a solid idea of who you are, and that's just, you just show people, you'd be amazed. Or put it you out know. there that you're a good person. If, if pe pe People with good good vibes or whatever yeah will will gravitate towards you they will I mean, you can still they be will. a victim but but as long as you're putting out yeah. the vibe that you know you're a good person not to be taken advantage of and you're just looking for good people then you're gonna find good people yeah. I, I know I found them it's true yeah definitely so yeah so so people also I've had people say something like actually not really many handful you need to just move on um, just for anybody out there I really have moved on I'm only doing these things First of all, kind of to tell my side because so much misinformation has gone out there about me. I just wanted to clear that up. But from also, the platform. Yeah, from the platform. <laughs> but also because I want, if anything I'm sharing can help you think about something or make you feel better, that's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for other people because I have moved on. And like I said, this is the only time I really, if there's other questions that you have, if I find that there's like a big chunk of something amiss, then yes, of course, you know, do a video to address it but overall this is going to be the only time I'm really like getting into this because it was very emotionally draining too and it's it's done there's nothing more I'm not like sitting back there whining about anything um I like no, to move you're on not like to, that no, at all not at all I'd like to move on to more positive things I will be starting um my own channel at some point soon kind of a different than what's out there right now to that I know about but anyway but you'll know you'll find out when I when it gets going I've got a few channels Please. going different top different scenario different um angles all together so cool yeah so, so it's it's how do you feel now i feel much better thank you all for listening really sorry it was so long i really tried to condense it but you know you are talking a lifetime of things and you know actually that was pretty darn good <laughs> but i think i, think, I guess yeah. overall but i can't help it it is what it is but this is what, to me, this is what woke me up, was realizing that my story was nothing compared to what other people have gone through. Yeah, mine isn't either. And that either. everybody has a story. Everyone has a story. Yeah, mine's you a know? thing. I wasn't abused. Oh, by the way, interesting thing, could have been, there was people that we were friends with, and apparently people in the congregation knew that our friend who was remarrying was remarrying a guy who was abusing his kids, and they never warned her, and then he abused hers, and it's a... It, complete nightmare mess and I used to stay there in the summertime I remember my mom freaking out <gasps> did he do anything to him I'm like no he didn't I think he only oh, liked his own goodness. kids disgusting mm. anyway but, um, but we're glad to be out we're glad to be out of the Jehovah's Witnesses and we do like to help people and we and people say why do you keep picking on the Jehovah's Witnesses and attacking them you know what when they stop attacking other religions when yeah. they stop attacking children when they stop protecting pedophiles i will gladly move away so they've got oh. certain policies that that i feel we need to do something about and um and i feel like we are making a difference and we are as we talked about we are experts yeah <laughs> with the jehovah's witnesses i'm not an expert yeah. against scientology i'm not an expert against mormons but the things that we do talk about i happen to know there are ex-scientologists and ex-mormons who do watch my channel and who are being right. helped by it because they can see the similarities yeah. of these cults and yeah. they're helped by it as well. And I'm happy, thrilled that these people feel that they're helped from watching it. I know I'm helped knowing that we're not alone. 
there are so many of these horrible organizations out there and we are there to help people who are trying to get out of them and realize that there's a life beyond this that is so much better than what you have now. Yeah. If I could just true. make that one point that it's it's yeah. very very important for me to say that. It is. And you're not and it's okay if you don't like all the channels and you really part of it is just getting out there and getting away from the ex witness stuff like you need to start your life. You need to get going. I used to always on a Saturday morning I'm like, "Oh, I'm going to be like, oh, two or three hours. This is mine. I'm not out in service. I used to actually literally count up the hours in a week that I wasn't spending on it, you know, and, and just look at that as bonus time, you know, little kind of little games like that. But, but you know what? I also find that we were part of a community before. And, and one thing about the extra of a community that, it, that is interesting is that it is a community. I think when you're, when you're part of such a close-knit, tight community as a Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses, I think, and then you, and then you feel like you've got the whole world now. It's like a kid in a candy shop. You don't know where to begin. And sometimes it's nice to know to feel where you belong. You realize that there are other people that have been hurt too. You're not alone, and it's kind of like it's just like a safety net. You don't have to be part of the XW community, but it's nice to know that it's there yeah. when you need it, and it is there. And there are some amazing people, you know, like Andrea um, and me. And <laughs> I was waiting for yeah, her to say, you. Oh, sorry. and you, and she didn't. No, I didn't want to like Andrea and Susan. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. No, I'm joking. But yeah, but there's some amazing people. You don't have to be part of it, but it's nice to know that you're not alone. And if yeah. you want to be part of a community, you've got one. Right. But if you don't want to be part of it and want to just put it all behind you, hey, we're, we're congratulating good. people. Good There's for all you. kinds of people that have. I met, in fact, it was so funny because the other day I had a, a workshop and there was two people in there, never knew each other. They both had been... <laughs> And as raised as JWs, it was so funny they didn't even know. But they have nothing to do with yeah. any of the ex -JW And good for community. them. I think yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. I is. wish There's I kind of wish I could be there. But There's on the other hand, I enjoy I enjoy doing what I do. Like I, like part of me feels like should I just yeah. put it behind me? Because that you know Yeah, but you know what? I wanna actually think that's I know something I was forgetting. Sure, yeah. There is like apparently my mother had told people that I hate Jehovah's Witnesses and I'm like wow where did she get that I, I know I read reread an email I'd sent to her and I'm like I didn't say that anywhere and there I don't know there are incredible wonderful people that are in the organization like we're not saying that they're not like there's a lot of great people there's also a lot of crappy people too there's like a there's a medley just like anywhere in any community mm -hmm. there is but this has to do with i don't really care what beliefs are i don't want to get into like oh there's this doctrine there's that i really don't like myself i'm not into any of that i don't need to prove anything to anybody or whatever that's up to everyone's got to do their own research who cares everyone can have their own belief what i again i will reiterate like what susan said before what the problem comes into play is where you're messing with people's lives with dangerous policies that are literally can kill people and the whole shunning thing where people have a lot of suicides a lot and that's that's a problem so the only thing we're working for is for change especially with a child abuse because children can need need their advocates and need people to stand up for them and people that are abused need justice so that's something you know that's really mm -hmm. important to us that we speak up against but as for beliefs and this and that don't really care the important part to me is mm -hmm. just that people understand you are allowed to leave the organization and if you do you have tons of support and not just from ex JWs there's lots of people out there tons mm -hmm. yeah and you'll yeah. be okay you'll be okay you will it's good thank you so okay. much everybody sorry I was so long but can't help it yeah, we have lots to say. And thank That's you right. for sharing your story. I know that wasn't it wasn't easy. Yeah, for you. I want to get over with. I just I'm a little bit ugh, tired today. I just got here, but I said oh, let's just hurry up and do this video because yeah. I was getting really like upset about it. So, yeah. but I feel well, good it now. Exciting. It's done. Yeah, it's well, done. good for you. It was a rough time as a kid. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, we'll sign okay. now, and yeah. very grateful to have you with us, thank and you so we'll much. talk we'll to you another time. Okay. Good. Bye. Bye.